Thank you. Um, so clearly you can't have a successful startup without having the right kind of talent. And we have a bunch of people on the stage who have really interesting, unique ways of finding that talent. So I'm gonna start it off really broad. Um, what are the creative things that companies are doing to look outside of the normal pools to find the right people for their company? I'll jump in. Um, so I'm going to say hacker rank since I'm sitting next to Vivek. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Machine Zone is a great customer. So I'll say that. Yeah. There you go. Um, I, I think everybody needs to take a step back and sort of figure out what you're trying to solve. Um, and depending on where you are in your life cycle as a company, what you're looking for is incredibly different. So if you are, you know, the proverbial two people and a brand new idea. Uh, the tools you're going to be looking for are very different. You're going to actually need people who are doers. You don't have the luxury at that stage and at that time to try to find people who are the best, most evolved managers with super high EQ and some of these psychological tests that people leverage. It's just, it's not relevant for you. You actually need to leverage a hacker rank. You need to be able to figure out who actually can code, who has code, uh, coding skills that I need, who's an incredibly hard worker, who believes in the mission, and really then those tools are focused around discovery of candidates, so what I call the top of the funnel um, tools, whether that be a job well or otherwise, there's some really clever tools that bring in a traditional candidates into the pool. Yeah, so uh, adding, adding on to that, uh, I feel like there's a fundamental shift that's sort of happening. Uh, if you look at the different recruiting trends that have happened, there was job boards that were, that were really, really big, and then like Monster and, and Indeed and, and others, and then, then you had like LinkedIn, which is again like a giant recruiting space. Uh, but what we are seeing repeatedly with customers is there should be a much better way to understand the skills and not just like which school did you go to or which company you worked at before. Uh, because if you look at the way that you can actually learn to code without having a four-year degree. So when that's the case, and every company is becoming a software company, then you're, you rely on skills way more than profiles. So that's the fundamental shift that we're seeing. And so I would sort of encourage people to move in the direction versus just assuming that because you went to this top-tier school or a company that, that you're really good. Yeah. Absolutely. I think for, especially for tech startups, everyone needs tech talent. And so the creative, crazy, innovative thing that Indel is doing is looking in totally untapped markets for that talent and where we can screen large, large pools of candidates for exactly um, that, you know, those specific skill sets. And so one of the things that our team is doing is uh, putting a lot of information and um, curriculum, et cetera, out to a very, very large population and then seeing how that population interacts with it and what skill sets are actually proving to uh, make an, uh, a, you know, a really uh, extraordinary distributed team member. And so we're, we're basically looking at 64 different indicators of success before we even bring someone, someone in for an interview based on how, they, um, how they're interacting with this online community. And so one thing that's happening right now, like you said, is that the old indicators like educational background, experience, um, they're not as effective as we once thought they were. So what indicators should uh, founders who are looking to staff their companies really be looking for when they hire? I, I would say it goes back to, it depends at what stage you're at, mm -hmm. but the fact that um, there are 64 indicators of success <laughs> suggests the fact that there is no true recipe. It's extremely uh, individualized. And so I think one of the things that's critical as a company is that you understand who you are, what's your mission, what is your vision, what are the types of people that align to that, because you can, you can find people who possess the skill sets, right? but you have to be very deliberate about what do I need to accomplish and then back in from there. Given that I need to accomplish X, what skill sets do I need, at what level, and then you can go find that. But um, we're all sort of struggling about what makes a successful uh, employee because there is no one recipe. There's just things that are, as Christina said, they're indicators, but everybody's looking for that secret sauce, what's the one thing? There is no one thing other than knowing who you are as a company, knowing what you want, and being very precise about finding that talent. 
because then that talent pool will connect with your vision, what you're saying, your needs, and there can be a perfect match. Yeah, also, the first, uh, <laughs> the first 10 engineers or the first 10 people is super, super critical. Like, I would almost, the, e the easiest framework to think about that is like, if, if, at five, if another 500 people are similar to your first 10 people, are you okay? Now, that increases the bar of who you want to hire as the first 10 people. And like in our case, like, like Shiv and Akshay, who are like our first two developers, still working at HackerRank, they're almost like co-founders. And so they yep. push the bar whenever we want to hire the next developer. So it's a good framework to think about it. Like if, are you okay with if 500 of them are very similar to the first 10? And then the maybes become a no yep. when you're thinking about recruiting. So I agree in some way that there's no secret sauce, but there are some common denominators for, for tech teams, for great developers. So I'll, I'll give you a little bit of the secret sauce of Andela. So you have to find extraordinary problem solvers. And the, the most easy way to do that is to give them something to build and observe them building it. How many times do they go back? Do they you know, try to look up things on their own and problem solve? A lot of people can, you know, are not able to do that during the hiring process. You need somebody yesterday. Your product is behind or over budget. Um, and so you, know, you gotta look for evidence of that. So what's a proxy for that? We look at language acquisition. We look at mastery of a musical instrument or um, a sports team. Some way that a person has taken a very complex problem and kept at it over years to perfect themselves at it. Uh, we find that, that, you know, that evidence of problem solving is absolutely critical. So we've touched on this a little bit, but when you're a startup in that very early stage of ramping up, what are your priorities um, when you're forming that early team? Action, movement, speed, hard work, right? And then you can sort of filter from there. You, you're beyond the stage where you have the luxury of you know, whiteboarding and what's this all gonna be. You're very shortly gonna be pitching to the, you know, the previous panel. And as everybody knows, they're not just investing in the product, they're investing in the team. And so you really need to make sure that you have a team that is inspiring, believes, and, and is willing to put in the extraordinary level of work required. Yeah, yeah like uh, passion for the mission and getting things done. Like, oh. honestly, there is, there's, not, there's no other reason why you would need to start a company. You have to get things done. So that's, that's almost the, the basic thing. Yeah. yeah, man, in the early, early days, like congratulations, startup founders. Like you are the founder and the janitor and the accountant and the head of HR and everything else. I mean, I look for people that are CEO of whatever their position is. If it's office manager, they're not gonna sleep at night if there's you know, a leak or something wrong, and I'm not going to be able to tell them even a fraction of, of what their job entails. They have to wake up and know that they completely and totally own that or not waiting for anyone to tell them that. And now, once we've grown, uh, we have just, I cannot say enough about our leadership in uh, Lagos, Nigeria, and in Nairobi, Kenya, and those people can um, you know, they can talk to every single developer on the team, know all of them by name. They can also interact with the president of that country and they can, you know, talk to the person on the street who's never heard of us um, and everything in between. They, they have to be comfortable at all those levels and be, you know, both humble and totally confident in order to do that. Yeah, yeah. just as a caveat, uh, <laughs> sorry. We, uh, we liked that, Christina. We wanted to feed <laughs> off that. Get in there. Like, it doesn't mean that after your 10th engineer you want people who can't get things done, uh, right? I mean, like, that, that's, that's a thing that, that is always there, but this re requires a level of intensity uh, much higher than what you would see in the normal one for the first few engineers, that's all, yeah. We still have to get things done, like, you, at any stage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, what I was gonna add to that is, early stages, you really are looking for those employees who, what I call, can do QA to CEO, someone who can scale up and scale down, and you have to be in it for whatever it is that needs to be done, roll up your sleeves and, and go forward. As you scale, you can move away from those edges slightly. You don't necessarily need somebody who can scale up to CEO or someone who could scale to, to and I'm just using QA as an example. But with how far you can move in, I think is really a function of how much scaffolding you're able to build in your company in the form of very strong leadership. If you don't build a lot of strong sort of middle management, um, and foundation for your company, you don't have a much, as much flex on either side in terms of the type of talent that you can hire. 
And so if you're hiring those candidates who are um, from non-traditional backgrounds, maybe they haven't done you know, a long stint at Google, maybe they don't come from Stanford's computer science program, what kind of training then gets um, outsourced to the company in order to acclimate those people? Oh, that's brutal. That, that's a tough question because it's much easier to, to grab talent than it is to grow talent. And I think you, you, we're at 1,200 people now. And, and the reason why everyone is so focused on the discovery problem, like how do I find new pools of talent, is that's still less time consuming than it is to actually invest in growing the talent. Yep. You know, nobody's perfected that magic of how do I grow an incredible We're working employee. on it. Yeah, yeah. Christina's <laughs> working on it. If she solves it, that's great. Um, but it, it's very difficult. So you see employers who are in hyper growth, everyone's trying to scale, you know, everybody's running a million miles an hour. We gravitate towards, okay, just find me a new pool of talent because I want to go grab right. it. And yes, I'll focus on growing talent, but the investment required for that, not just in resources, but in time is extraordinary. And you really have to be very intentional about, I'm gonna grow that talent. So these uh, hiring through these typical channels, I'm gonna hire somebody who is at Google, or I'm gonna hire from Stanford. They're just proxies for, you know, for some ease. I think my bet is gonna be that employee is gonna be plug and play. I can just put them in the chair and they're gonna go. When you widen your funnel, you really have to have a two-fold approach of saying, I'm willing to commit to actually growing the talent because some of the set skill sets may not be there, but that's okay. Because you know, somebody I grow personally is gonna be incredible, but it truly is an investment. Yeah, I can, I can share an anecdote. Uh, so how many of you would have called up this candidate where the resume was a dishwasher at a restaurant and they applied for a software developer role. We would. Okay, <laughs> except, except for Andela. So, <laughs> so this is a real story, uh, so I'm not making this up on the fly. So this person, this was a resume, uh, took the Hacker Rank Challenge, um, joined VMware, and is now, is, has gotten promoted twice since then, and is now like sort of in the real fast-paced growth path inside the company. So I, in my personal opinion, it's sort of a myth that like, you, if you don't come from a traditional background, you need to train more, primarily because the amount of things that you can learn on your own is just, is just huge. It's just massive that, that is available. So, and people are creating, inventing new things without prior knowledge. So, uh, so that's, that's an example of that. So I, I do think like, it, it should be more, how can we transform the recruiting into a skill-based mode uh, rather than pedigree. That, that, that should be the core focus of it. So. I love this question. So let's go back to what are we going to do about that gap between the number of jobs we need filled and the actual training to fill it. So right now, we count about 1.8 million open jobs for software developer in the US alone. Um, the senior VP of Indeed.com, I think just today or yesterday, said we're going to create 1.3 new million jobs for software developers and only about 400,000 people to meet them. So if you take all of the computer science degrees uh, graduates, the engineering degree graduates, and boot camp graduates, you won't even come close to approaching that. So we're going to have to figure out how to do this. Uh, and this is you know, exactly to the heart of what, what Andela has done. And there's no way to do it except to go big. And so we find people with a, a great, a, you know, a strong foundation most of them have a four-year degree in CS or engineering. And then the first six months of their employment with the company is basically simulated uh, environments in which they're going deep in business soft skills and technical skills. And so that's how do you join a distributed team in great, great detail. So we say, your first meeting with a new team, do you know what time it is? Do you know what the purpose of that meeting is? Do you know how everyone you know, relates to everybody else, what the purpose of their positions are? How are you gonna introduce yourself? Do you have the camera at the right angle and the lighting at the right angle? Like everything we need to be an absolutely excellent distributed team because we're not, we're not gonna be able to solve these challenges other ways. So we put our developers through you know, basically improv-based simulation training where they're actually building products like that before they move on to, on to client teams. So we're helping to solve that gap between those. And this is a great place to dig into how do you work with a distributed team? <laughs> Invest in the right yeah. tools. Yeah. Yeah. Difficult. Commit to it. That's when yep. you start to need strong managers. So what's sort of interesting is it's very skill-based 
for certain positions and at certain stages of the company. But at some point, you need managers. And that is a lot of soft skills that are very difficult to hire for, to train for, um, and obviously, it's very difficult to, to, to scale. So. Yeah, well, I don't think there's a silver bullet like where you can actually solve the distributed team. Like uh, we have a team in London, Bangalore, and Palo Alto. Uh, and one thing, and, and this is like what was very interesting for us, is when you have in-person interactions, or like you know when you bring the team, or when you bring sort of key PMs, engineering engineers from Bangalore to here, or vice versa. When you meet them in person, uh, the relationship gets much better. Even just one interaction. Uh, it's like it's a hack. Uh, probably my company doesn't even our company doesn't even know this. I'm like uh, opening this up. So so that is something that we want to do more uh, because like automatically like it, it becomes much better. But we've not found a clear way to solve it. We have also sort of rearranged the teams in a way that um, the teams like the product engineering design for a particular product. All of them are co-located. So that like there is less of a back and forth if you have to iterate really, really fast. So that's like a change that we have made, which is starting to show results, but something that we need to see over the year. There's no way to do distributed except to really, really commit to it. You've got to be on Slack. You have to have overlapping work hours. You have to commit to uh, getting to know that individual on a, you know, both a personal and professional level. Um, for, for our teams, we ensure you know, that they're, they're actually prepared to, to really communicate well in a distributed fashion. And as I said, that's everything from just being truly informed before you get on whatever it is, Google Hangout or, you know, a Slack, a Slack call, turning off all other things, uh, you know, committing to the conversation, uh, introducing yourself, you know, sending the right material beforehand. And then we've also, we, um, we do an in-person orientation with our, all of our partners as well. So our developers will come for between two weeks to a month and kind of get to know the real culture um, of the team, sit with them, you know, get to know the personalities, and then go back and work in a distributed fashion. And they do that about once a year. And that is an important part as well. So I think it's really the combination, the hybrid uh, of building the relationship, you know, being committed to the work, uh, and then, you know, following those, those patterns and best practices. Uh, so I'm going to seg here to a topic. Um, I know we have some interesting opinions on the stage. Um, but one thing a lot of companies are figuring out is we have diversity reports. The numbers are coming out. How do you translate those numbers into um, a staff that looks diverse? And how do you change your funnel to pick up on that? So I suspect I'm the odd man out on this topic. <laughs> uh, I would say it this way. Uh, I do think tech is a, is a great equalizer because you can test for skill sets. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I question a little bit the premise of the goal needs to be diversity, because I'm not sure what that means. I think the goal needs to be diverse teams, diversity of thought, whatever that is. But you could have somebody who has a very uh, disadvantaged background, who had you know, no uh, favors handed to them, didn't go to any of the right schools, didn't have a background that is in any way impressive. And that, to me, is a diverse candidate as well. So the studies show that diverse teams uh, deliver the best ideas. I, I'm just sort of on the, I have sort of a professorial view on this of, should we be focusing on diversity, meaning I need to hire X amount of women, I need to hire X amount of minorities? And I say that as a woman, as a minority, as a mother, sort of in all those categories, that we need to be very careful about how we're approaching the problem and are we solving the right problem. And the thing I'll add, for those of you who don't know me, is you know, I was in employment for far longer than I'd like to admit, because it'll reveal my age. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a difficult problem that the courts grapple with as well, right? When you, when you cross that line and say, I want a female candidate, that's not okay. The law does not permit that. So it cannot be the overriding factor. And so I worry sometimes that the discussion becomes too focused on just discrimination, right? If I want 
a woman, it's at the expense of somebody else. And I think we need to take a step back and say, what am I trying to achieve? I'm trying to achieve teams that are cohesive, that are hard charging, that are ex extremely smart, and I'm gonna change my view of where those people come from. And I know this sounds like a lot of meritocracy nonsense, but it actually does, if Machine Zone is an actually perfect example of, it ends up in incredibly diverse teams in and of itself without you having the lens of, I want A over B. I'm gonna push back a little. I, a little. So Kristen and I have become fast friends over the <laughs> past few, last few days. I love her heels, they're insane. Um, so you, if you are on a product team, there's the surest way to, to ensure that you will only have white males using that product is to build it with all white males. We have to get diverse teams together. And I, so I agree, yes, diversity of thought. Um, but you know, 50% of your clients out there in emerging markets and all of these different things, you have to have those people in the creation process in order to have the products to really, really fit them. And so not saying it isn't hard, it's a huge challenge, but there are you know, lots and lots of ways to get diverse you know, candidates into your talent pool. And, and Kristen's right, it, it, doesn't, it does no good to women in the field of tech to not be absolutely merit-based. So we need to only hire the most qualified, fierce candidates. And they're out there, but you do have to work a little bit harder to get them out there. And so what we do is we push hard to have a certain amount of women in our, in our interview pool. So obviously we have uh, extremely diverse software developers coming out of, of six African countries. Um, but we also, you know, we push hard. All of our recruitment teams do have quotas in the interview process. So we have to create a wave and let young women know from those in degree programs to those even considering what degree they want to be in, that this is a career path for them, that they have mentors, that they have support along the way. And that is like, you know, we need everyone in the tech field pushing that forward. Yeah. I know we are slightly over time, so I would just say diversity is important. <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, but yes, I mean, like we, as, as I said, like in you know, a skill-based, higher skill-based approach is super important, and like we actually do a lot to improve that as well. I don't want to go into deeper, but we actually anonymize the candidate's name, any of the personally identifiable information, and only show skills to the to our customers, to a select set of customers where we have seen improvement in, in diversity. But but to your point, like it shouldn't be like sort of the only goal, but something that you should keep in mind when you're trying to recruit. Okay. Yeah. And I think that's a great note to end on. We're, we're about out of time, but I think we're all much more equipped to hire. Um, thank you to our panelists, and thank you to our audience. Uh, stick around. There's a great panel on brand messaging coming up after this. Okay, thank you, everyone.